Remarkably, I think it's still pretty much the same, which is a good thing. There was a whole lot of, there were a lot of musicians around town and a whole lot of music, but at the time, really no place to play. So once clubs started opening, really opened a floodgate in terms of all these musicians that were around and good bands playing. Um, and it seems like it's still the same now. I mean, there's a, I think that the amount of music coming out of this town is disproportionate to the size of the town. And even though it's a college town and to a certain extent you expect that, it still seems like it's kind of special in that fashion. I, you know, I think there's really good music everywhere. Some towns uh, take it on, like Austin. They want to be a destination for music. Whatever the reason, the people who are running the clubs and the bars and the restaurants, something in the town says, we want to foster this. But I think that, um, you know, Athens had their moment. Charlottesville has had Dave Matthews, but you know, what other band is really skyrocketed out of here, you know? Um, I'd say Richmond's had more success. So I'm not so sure there's anything that unique. Um, just the, the vibe, the college town, the, you know, your server has a PhD in philosophy kind of thing going on, and it's just, it just, people like different stuff. It's a good town. It has been a good town to be in. I mean, you know, like I still play music. You know, nobody, nobody calls me to play music. We just make our own thing, and it's, it's, it's a nice, it's a good place to do it. It's a good place to do it. You know, I moved here with uh, uh, my buddies, Man Out Jr., uh, Justin Vilchak, Damani Harrison, B.J. Pendleton, William White, and we all just we moved here because of uh, more music, and it, this, the town delivered on that. You know, expectation. Great local music scene. I love Charlottesville, and I love the musicians. I love to meet people, and music brings people together. It's terrific. Well, you know, in Rich's book, they talk about how there's no real one scene, and I would say that that's pretty accurate. There are a lot of great musicians, and there are a lot of uh, people that are supporting each other um, on various levels. Um, but yeah, I mean, as for a scene, I wouldn't say it's a scene. It's, it's a lot of scenes, and it's no scene. It's just, I, I'm fond of saying you can't swing a dead cat by the tail without hitting a musician in this town. And, and all of them are good. And, and there are a lot of different kinds of musicians. Charlottesville. Let me think. I've had so many good ones here. I'd have to say that the first time I sat in with Dave Matthews' band at John Paul Jones Arena and my mom was in the crowd uh, was one of the best, one of the funnest experiences I've ever had here. It was really cool to play on that level at home, but also it was just great to have my mom in the audience. So. You know, she took me to guitar lessons when I was 11 and carted me around with my Fender Super 6 amp to get me to band practice where she knew I was up to no good, but it was nice to have her there. So that was a great experience. <laughs> I think my one of my favorite things was way back down in the mine shaft, the people working out, Charlie Pasterfield, who needed to have something else to do because there's not enough to keep him you know, really entertained and, and business. He put together something called Guitar Army a long time ago down there. It was a Monday night thing, which was a slow night. 
and he just invited all these guitarists to come on down. So what it was was like a drummer and a bass player and 10 or 12 guitar players. And they were playing simple sort of rock and roll, bluesy songs, and then everybody got to take a break, you know, with it. And it was just like one of these wonderful things. And then, you know, the man just showed up everywhere. Charlie Pasterfield's been everywhere, and he's been a great uh, you know, spark for everybody in this town. There's been some others, to be sure. But uh, one of the crazy guys loves music, loves people, and everybody loves him. Back in the day, um, this would have been mid-80s, I guess, uh, I spent about a year on the road with the Skip Castro Band, working as truck driver, sound man, roadie, piano tuner, guitar tech, etc. Uh, that was a great education. I had a lot of fun and learned that I didn't want to do that anyway. I'd say the second thing that like brought me into this whole gig about what's so important is WTJU. And I'm the longest running DJ in WTJU's history, and I'm not done yet. And uh, it's all about what goes on at that radio station. Because it's about such a wash of music, the whole span of music that's so important, you get introduced to these incredible things that you might never hear anywhere else if you weren't listening to that station. And I gotta tell you, that is so deep in my heart. Ah, that's what it's all about. Yes, indeed. So I could say, you know, hip to the tip and all of that business, but it's what it's all about. So don't you forget it, no doubt. I'm actually playing in a band these days with Charlie from Skip Castro called the Gladstones. And uh, we opened for one of my favorite bands of my whole life, NRBQ. Uh, this is uh, about a year ago, I guess now, but it seems like yesterday. And it was just such a thrill. And to me, it was, you know, it's like, wow, this can still happen. One, one of the most magical experiences I ever saw was TR3 down in Miller's. Johnny Gilmore on drums, Houston on bass, Tim Reynolds on guitar. Johnny took a drum solo. He took an amazing drum solo. It was, you know, pure gilly, lots of space, but then like explosions of sound and funky as all get out. And at the end of the solo, he, he's like, what, what more can I do? And then he just smiled and reached over and started turning the light that was on by the drum set on and off and playing with one hand. <laughs> it was, I mean, it was epic. Um, just seeing Tim play down there on Monday nights, just surrounded with his electric and acoustic, a sitar, a shakers, drums, whatever, I mean, just picking up whatever and making music, pure music, just improvised. It was really, I'm, I feel, blessed to have seen that. It was really, really good. <laughs> Getting to see Clyde Stubblefield come through town when he was playing in the band for What Do You Know? At, uh, they did that show at the Performing Arts Center one time with uh, Hogwiler Ramblers played and Clyde Stubblefield was in the band and the day before Andy Waldeck called me and said, you'll never guess who I have on the other line. And I said, you're right. And he said, Clyde Stubblefield. And so he was looking for some drum stands, and I had some. And he used my drum stands when he was playing. They played at the Prism that night. I drove around town with Clyde Stubblefield. He ate barbecue in my living room. And I said, Clyde, if there's one thing you could tell somebody about playing the drums, what would it be? And he sat and thought for a few minutes. He said, be a chef. Sometimes you gotta sizzle fry some things over here. Sometimes you gotta slow cook some things over here. So be a chef. And I was like, man, that was cool. Seeing P-Funk down the tracks, that was awesome. When I first got here, I met a young kid, uh, Jay Pun, who was going to Tandem High School then. And uh, he worked out a deal so that he could come to my house every Wednesday to record his first record. And I would call his teachers and say that Jay showed up and worked diligently, which he did. He had a great work ethic then. So meeting him and, and watching those kids put something together was really fun. It was fun to be part of. Uh, later on, uh, Leroy Moore and myself 
wrote letters to Berklee College of Music for Jay to help him get in. And he went and graduated, which no one really ever does. So. <laughs> and he met more women there, so that was neat. So that was a gratifying, interesting experience. You know? And then another one of my favorite uh, Charles Little music experiences, I was rehearsing with Sarah White and Ted Pitney and Michael Bishop at the Coke building. And Sarah White looked at me as the best piece of musical advice I ever got. She said, I love what you're doing, just do it less. You know, that's a good question because I think different ways about that. And uh, I was just thinking of uh, my fr acquaintance, friend, really cool guy, Stuart Holm. And I moved here about nine years ago. So I was trying to start playing music about seven, six years ago, something like that. And I would see these, you know, wonderful players at Dirty Nellies and, and places like that because I didn't know the scene very well. But I re one of my favorite memories, m musical experience, it's kind of like an appreciation of a guy like Stuart, where I was strolling by Miller's, and I didn't, I, I don't even think I went in, but Stuart was there in the way he loves to play bass, and I take a bass lesson from this guy every time I watch him play, you know, never, you know, I'm just watching. And he's got his eyes closed, and he's playing some R&B uh, at Miller's late at night, and I'm like, that's, that, that guy's real. I got so many favorites and we're so lucky, but uh, the first one I ever what pops in my mind is uh, the Hong Kong Ramblers, first time I saw them at Fellini's, which was back like 1989 or 90, something like that, when they were playing there. I'd never heard anything quite like that before, and it was, it was awesome. There, there, there's two that come to mind. Uh, one is seeing Neutral Milk Hotel. I was bartending at Tokyo Rose. They ended up staying at our house. Uh, and it's just, it was just, you know, it was right around when in the airplane over the sea came out. And uh, it was just, you know, the whole room just kind of blew up. It was just fantastic. And the other one, it's probably, it's a tie. Hud House shows, uh, just any of them, but lightning bolt there, feeling the floor bow, uh, oh, hey, yeah. uh, or Oneida, same thing, same thing, opening for them. Favorite Charlottesville music memories. I've been here 18 years, and so my uh, my catalog is limited. But uh, yeah, well, there, there are a lot of great shows at Star Hill Music Hall uh, that started, I guess, in 99 when I moved here. And, I mean, bands like that, that now are kind of part of the, I guess, the, the jam scene, you know, Lexicon or like Soul Live. I remember that they were jamming so hard, or the people, the audience was jamming so hard, the glass windows and the ceiling were kind of <laughs> going like this, you know. There's uh, only a, there's zero shows actually besides that one where I remember that happening. I was like, man, we're we got a good thing going on right here. You know? Well, one of them that's probably a little unusual um, is going to the West Virginia on the corner. So it was downstairs underneath the Virginia restaurant, and it was just like a little dive, but it was. I love the energy there. And that's where I was taught by these black, soulful musicians and dancers how to dance to the blues, these blues moves. And, you know, back then, when at that age, they probably seemed like old men to me, but they were probably middle age, I don't know. But, you know, I still remember those moves, and I still do those moves. And I just love that place. The energy was great, you know, and all the bands playing at that time were playing there. I can't remember, probably late 70s, 80s. I don't remember when the West Virginia closed. So that was a really special place for me. And one of my favorite little stories is he was in the band, the All Stars opened up for Muddy. This would have been around the late 70s. Muddy Waters. Yeah, Muddy. And they were down in the mine shaft in the back room. My buddy said, yeah, sure, we'll come on in. So I was back there when a young lady from, I think, the Cavalier Daily was interviewing her. And she was saying, you know, uh, 
Mr. Walters, it's understood that you're one of the greatest blues singers of all time. And he goes, hold on there, dog. I am the greatest blues singer of all time. I don't think we're allowed to talk about our favorite musical experiences. We'd be throwing prison or something in these politically correct yeah, days. No, I, I'm uh, kind of serious. So. Yeah, we'd be in deep trouble. Yeah, so we might have to skip that question. When I was a kid, I snuck into ATO fraternity and I saw a band called Captain Tunes, which is now split off into different, later became the Casuals and Skip Casho, basically. And, uh, People always came in, the touring bands would jam with them, like the Nighthawks and people. So that, and they allowed me to sit in with them and stuff. And uh, that had a profound effect. And concerts at University Hall back then, when I saw Sly and his Family Stone in 68, blew my mind. First time I really heard loud bass. Okay. Yeah. About 1971, they had Little Feet played in the hall. With Bonnie Ray. Yeah, the Bonnie Ray. I still have that poster. Uh, that was a mind blowing experience. Uh, those guys were so good. Uh, they, they made it sound effortless. I mean, you just sat there and listened to them. They had, I think, one of the greatest drummers in rock and roll, Richie Hayward, uh, Lowell George, singing and playing guitar. It was, just, it was really one of those experiences. Like, I don't know what the hell I want to do exactly, but I'd love to be able to do that. It was a band called The Deal, uh, the first real band I was ever in. I uh, started when I was uh, in college, my last year. It went on for about eight years after that. But this was this was right after we graduated. We were sort of turning professional, and we played the mousetraps. It felt great. I would say one of my favorite is uh, being at place on the corner for a karaoke birthday party and actually Rich and Polly walked in just at last call with Franz Nikolai who desperately wanted to sing Fairy Tale of New York as a karaoke and they'd already made the cutoff but they let him sing anyway and it turned into an all night charades game hang out with a wonderful musician that I had no idea I'd be meeting that night and just one of those kind of classic Charlottesville stories I think. The two that popped into mind, if you, in case you need it, uh, the concert for Charlottesville obviously is pretty moving, um, and just massive in its scope, and you know the, the people that were involved. It's cool to see somebody like Charles Owens up there playing with the Roots and you know things like that. Um, and then we did a thing, an ugly sweater party at the Jefferson last December, where Coda and Kai. Um, kind of put together this super group of Tom Petty covers. Um, and, and Adam Long was great too, doing Fleetwood Mac as like the opening band. And then those guys did a whole tribute to Tom Petty, which was really neat. Um, but I hate to say like, <laughs> they're, um, I, it, it's one of those th conflicting things because I know they get asked to do tributes a lot of times and I'm sure that's frustrating for them. Um, like the whole Mockstars thing I think has been great for the local scene in terms of people get, an average fan gets to go out and see all the amazing talent in one, one or two nights, you know. But then again, those bands are being asked to play other people's songs, so. Um, but yeah, I feel stuff like this is, this might actually be it. <laughs> this is pretty awesome. <laughs> Well, you know, you got to get with Skip, Skip Castro and the gang. They, you got to start there, I think, because they just they went back in time, they went ahead in time, they did their whole deal, and they're just so much fun. I think you have to think of the All Stars before that, who really said, "Hey, there is this thing called blues, and and we know about it, and we can play it, and that's what we're dedicated to." But you can go on and on and on. When you think about the musicians in this town, when you think about John Durf, when you think about the jazz musicians, the million of them around town who have said, hey, what about this? Why don't you pay attention to jazz? Because it's very, very hip, and indeed it is. And so, you know, and it all has just 
meld it around. And that's what the that's what the key to Charlottesville is, I do believe. It's that whatever, whether it's Dave Matthews coming in and saying, what about this twist? And it's someone else coming in that way, that it still grows, and it grows from day to day, from year to year, week to week. And that's the beauty of this community, because it's open to all of those things, both through the musician circle and through the, the public. Lots of, uh, lots of great music in this town. Um, through the years. Definitely uh, Skip Castro and Johnny Sport Coat, the casuals featuring Johnny Sport Coat, excuse me. Uh, when I first came to school here, those were popular bands and those were just great party bands. Well, I was manager of Skip Castro for a couple of years. Um, casuals, um, The Deal, I think they were a very underrated band. Um, 108 with Mike Lewis and uh, Billy Brockman. Um, Charles Hill Blues All Stars. They really gave me a blues education, per se. So that's one nice thing about being in Charlottesville. You get um, exposed to so many types of music, which I think is, is a really good thing. We were called originally the Charlottesville Blues All-Stars, and we shortened that eventually to just the All-Stars from Charlottesville, Virginia. So we were the first guys around. I moved here in 72 from New York, and uh, we were the first band to play this kind of music, play blues here. We were the first and really only band to put out a record on a commercial label and tour pretty extensively until, I guess, until Dave Matthews came along. And the All-Stars, we were the first band, I think, in Charlottesville to have a record contract, which in those days was a big deal. And it wasn't a very good record contract, but it was a record contract. We had a real record that we did not put out ourselves. The All-Stars from Charlottesville, Virginia, the album was called Tip Your Waitress. And uh, I was the harmonica player and occasional singer in uh, the All-Stars. We had uh, a, uh, a woman singer, Lucille Shuttle, who sang about half the material. And our guitarist you just uh, interviewed, Dick, Richard, he likes to be called Richard, but he was known as Dick Green back in the, back in the day. And, uh, and I sang some of the songs too. I would always sing one or two songs a set. I think that's a great question. Um, I would have to say, all things considered, Charlie Pasterfield, he's just such an amazing person and musician. And the thing that I love the most about him is that in music, you just have that inevitable self-centeredness that me, 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 look at me. And he just doesn't have that. He's, he just loves other people's music, he loves to help other people. He has, he has been the glue and so many connections in Charlottesville music. And so, including ourselves, that very first band, The Deal, he got us a PA. And I went on to play music with him years later, and I just hold him in the highest regard. And I think answering that question would have to be him, Charlie Pastor. Well, I mean, one of my favorites was Johnny Sporco and the Casuals. I mean, just going regularly to the Mineshaft and all the other great bands that played there. But I, I really had just a lot of fun dancing to them because I'm a dancer, so. And, uh, so that was always a great time. But interestingly enough, at the same time, there was a band called Modern Logic that was playing over at Zippers. Or what was it called? Right around the corner on Main Street. I think it was Zippers. And they were at, oh, this was later when Dave Matthews was playing on, uh, I guess, Tuesdays and Tracks, which is always great fun, too. I love that. In the early days of Dave Matthews. Um, but on Mondays, Modern Logic would play at Zippers on Main Street. And I thought they were one of the most outstanding bands that Charlottesville ever had. But, you know, they didn't sort of get noticed as much. But they did put out a couple cassettes, I think. And I used to play them on the radio because I was a DJ at WTJU for decades, starting in 1983. So, um, anyway, they were great too. Love DMB. Uh, I remember being in the basement of Sigma Nu and seeing Dave play solo, and he already had like 15 sorority girls hanging on every side. And I turned to my friend Stephen Barley and I said, 
man, if this guy can't make it in the record business, something's wrong. But little did we know he'd be jamming with the Stones and, you know, <laughs> Neil Young. And but, uh, but in a way, I was sort of like, you know, the business actually had some merit because he really was talented. And, and or he still is. <laughs> that was, I mean, it was phenomenal hearing those songs the first time, Unknown. And then seeing the band, the tracks was great. Around Town? Man, there's so many. I mean, I love Eli Cook, Rockin'. Um, I just saw Devin for the first time in years. I hadn't seen her in so many years. I worked with her, like, I think it was maybe her second record, uh, way back in the day. Helped her do guitar sound, so it was really fun to see her again. Um, you know, Dana Alderson on the bass, our Australian wonder wonder child, man. He's amazing. I got to play with him a bunch, and actually took him out to Carter's house uh, from DMB and got to play with Carter and Dane, which was pretty fun. He's a mind blower, and of course, I've always loved the jazz on Thursdays, John to Earth, and it's been amazing. Um, well, TR3 is definitely near the top of the list. Um, always enjoyed a lot of the jazz in town. I remember uh, taking the history of jazz and Scott DeVoe, one of those guys, and he had Cosmology come and play. And Tim played bass. And it was like, this is no fair that this guy can play bass like that too. That is just not really fair. There's so many. Um, that, that's the challenging thing about this, is that there's so much good music here. Um, just Jim Wave is a favorite, for sure. Um, oh man, I still uh, love Jim Wave and will go see him anywhere, anytime. It's, it's a soul-feeling music and it just really makes everything a little bit better. The Hackensaw Boys played at my wedding, so they're big favorites in any incarnation they have. Rude Buddha. So they haven't been around in a million years, but they, um, back in the early 80s, they were doing things that nobody else was doing. Just totally original music. Um, some people had trouble understanding it as music. That's how original it was. But they were, uh, I think they went to New York after a while and then, you know, imploded. But um, they were really something back in the early 80s. Locally, um, Union of a Man and a Woman, who were stamped, but uh, Curious Digit, uh, trying to think about lately, a guy who's just moved to town as Daniel Bachman, and he's an astounding guitar player, he's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful acoustic guitar player. Uh, the ones that are coming to mind right now, yeah. Uh, all of 15 was probably my favorite Charlottesville band um, back in the maybe early aughts. I remember the first the first band I saw was, um, I'm not sure what the name, maybe it was Plutonium or no, it, it was Matthew Wilner and Houston Ross and Johnny Gilmore. And I, I guess I'm, I'm moved by seeing those guys first in particular because then I went on to see Johnny and Houston as a, as a rhythm section and many other uh, bands and many other bars at least if even if it wasn't a band it was in another place and and that really impressed upon me that that's kind of the way to succeed it, or you know it your definition of success has to depend on what, what you're thinking about. For me, I was thinking about how do I immerse myself and play with as many musicians as possible and, and get to play as many styles as possible and just get to be part of something apart from the music. And so those guys were kind of a gateway into seeing that that was how this town operated. There have been great bands though. Astronomers, Anatomy of Frank. Um, give a shout out to BC. I don't think there's a tighter band in Charlottesville. They played every Sunday night in Miller's for a decade. And I'm telling you what, them guys are tight. <laughs> I've been enjoying a lot of stuff that's been coming out real recently. Um, 
just in the past year, you know, we've had Lord Nelson, Cameo Whiskey, Iron and Wildfire put out a great album last fall. Free Union is a cool new project. Michael Coleman is doing cool stuff. So those are probably the four that immediately come to mind. Uh, Sarah White and the Pearls, definitely. Seeing them at Atomic Burrito was great. Um, Larkspur I like a lot. It's Annabeth. Uh, I work at 1061 The Corner, so she came by and saw us pretty early on. and. It's like, wow, this is really good. And then she ends up forming this group of Charlottesville people. So it's always cool to see things grow and develop, you know, from when you initially discover them and then they go on to do bigger and bigger things each time they play or each time they make an album. So. And the whole chamomile and whiskey thing, that just really got me hooked on Charlottesville music. Also, they just make me feel like I have ants in my pants whenever I listen to them play. I really like the kids from Disco Risque. They uh, a lot of energy, they're fun, nice guys, they're clever, they're funny. And we are star children who are just unbelievable. They bring the community together and uh, they're so creative and they're all just individually super nice people. I haven't been doing music in this town for a long time, but the few years that I've been here it's just been packed with really great artists. And Actually, I have about 30 favorites, but if you ask me my favorite, I think I'd have to say Cam I mean, the recent people that we have, I don't know, we got four dozen bands. We are so lucky to have all the music we have here. Now. Good sound system, listeners who stay and pay attention to the music, a captive audience, a really great band, or a couple really great bands, being able to get your drink fairly quickly, and not getting thrown up for I'd say ultimately my favorite was the Mind Show. And the reason being, it was like a family. Everyone who played there got to just roll in whenever they wanted. Uh, there was music there seven nights a week. It just felt great to be a part of it. And it was also where we were playing. We kind of hit our own peak in that, again, that original band, The D. So uh, I would say the Mind Shaft. I'm trying to think. You know, I don't know that I really had a favorite venue in Charlottesville. We used to play at the Mine Shaft a lot. And um, there was a place called the West Virginia, and it was a little basement place on the corner. But, you know, I guess my favorite venues in Charlottesville, ironically, were fraternities. They were the ones who really treated us well. They paid well. There was one place where we used to go, and they'd load the equipment in for us, and when I went to play, they'd have a garbage can full of beer for the rest of the band, but I didn't like, uh, you know, domestic beer. So they'd have a six pack of some kind of imported beer on my side of the stage and a bottle of cognac. Dave Matthews and those people were far younger than, than, than me. They, that, the guys in that band, a lot of them, they were too, when we were playing, they were too young to get into the clubs. So I've talked to them since those days. And they used to, like at the Mine Shaft, which was uh, a famous, at the time, it was a well-known club in Charlottesville, right on, uh, uh, I guess that's Main Street, where, uh, uh, and they used to listen at the back door because they weren't old enough to get in. So they would... They would crack open the back door and listen to the music, but the, the door guy wouldn't let them in because they weren't old enough. I'd have to say the old mine shaft. Um, loading in and out was kind of a bitch, but, um, and it smelled terrible. <laughs> but we just, you know, it was so reliable and, and it sounded good and the people were so friendly and you knew everybody and great shows came through there. Um, so you could, you know, see Greg Allman one night and then your pissy little band could play the next night. And so it was uh, an institution. Well, I think we're really lucky to have the Jefferson. The Jefferson's a nice venue. 
Um, I always liked the old mine shaft, which was not a nice venue. It was a, can I say shithole? It was a shithole. Um, the plumbing was held together by duct tape. The ceiling was low. It was, it was rank, but I saw a burning spear play there. Like 80 people. Winston Rodney's like five feet away from me, giving me the evil eye. It was amazing. Mine shaft. Mine shaft, without a doubt. I mean, God, I mean, Robert Cray, uh, Greg Allman. Um, pretty much on any given night, you can find anybody. I mean, Robert Palmer did uh, two nights there, you know, two sets a night. So, and then of course, skip every Monday. You had uh, Charlie with uh, Captain Toons and Fabulous Note Guns, which introduced and uh, Ham and Eggs, which introduced me to reggae music. So, you know, I learned a lot from these guys over the years. Venues, my goodness. Well, you know, I mean, the mine shaft had to be the, uh, the beginning. And there were other places you could go, of course, but that really was its own kind of happening. Uh, certainly, there was that Star Hill. Um, and across the street, I don't even know if I can remember the name of that place. Uh, Tracks was over there, as a matter of fact, and they weren't even called Tracks to begin with, they were called something else. But they were bringing people in. So they had local bands playing there. They also had, we went, uh, WTJU presented with Big Joe Turner at Tracks, as a matter of fact, and they were backed up by, uh, you know, uh, Skip Castro and, and Horns and so on, uh, who were working it all out. Um, and now I just think that the smaller clubs are really the best place to be because you're in with it. There's nothing wrong with the big, the big settings, I guess. But when you're in there and you're one, I saw Sun Ra at a place that was a grocery store and then got cleaned out and all that stuff. He played in our city, Sun Ra in the orchestra. And I'm telling you, we were headed to Saturn by the time that thing was over. So that's what's amazing. It's Sometimes it's the venue, and sometimes it's the attitude of the venue that says, hey, we'll try this, we'll try that. It doesn't all have to be rock, or it doesn't all have to be blues, or it doesn't all have to be this. It's people who are adventurous about the music. That's what's made this place a special place to me. Tracks, of course. Max, because of day playing there every Tuesday. But Tracks was another one where the Neville Brothers, um, 10,000 Maniacs, um, you go down and see um, Coco Taylor. Uh, I'm trying to think of the guy that should be in the Hall of Fame that was down there. It's like 50 people. It was on a Sunday night. It'll hit me as soon as I walk away, of course. But but just the um, smithereens. I mean, the music in town were just was just astounding for a town this size, but one of the things with Charlottesville, it's a rowdy town, which a lot of people didn't realize. That's why you get the bands on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, rather than weekends. Because being in the music business, it's cheaper to you know, do a gig for a hundred bucks rather than not do a gig and lose that money. You know, it's, it's really hard because there's a whole bunch of them mixed together, but the place I think what I most enjoyed was a nightclub called the CNO. Um, Back in the days, back in the 80s, it was a absolutely fabulous venue, and we, uh, it, it's something I think Charles, I wish, I wish there was something like that today. It was just, it was just the right size, you had a, you had a really, you had a nice stage, so you're up, uh, had a nice dance area, plus. It was a real music club. It was, yeah, it was It a wasn't real, a restaurant. Yeah, I mean, you had the restaurant part, but they used the restaurant to cover their, their liquor license. So that was why and the drinking age was 18. Yeah. So basically everyone could go, and in those days anywhere. And the West Virginia? The West Virginia, and the mine shaft. Below the Virginia. That mine shaft, everyone used to squawk about it, but there was an awful lot of great music down there. Uh, there used, a lot of us used to play at the Prison Coffee House. This is back in the, in the 60s or the very early 70s. So that's another place that was quite memorable. C&O. That was, a, that was a really fun venue. I did uh, lights in there on occasion for Sandy. And, you know, had a little perch up there to see a bunch of stuff with the Blue Sparks from Hell Out in New Jersey. Um, bands like that. So It's been... Uh, oh, the uh, guy I was trying to think of, Warren Zevon. He was on a Sunday night or something. 
but yeah, it's been a great experience here in Charlottesville. Saw some other great band. Mo's Allison at the CNO. It's another small venue that's gone. Just great. But tracks probably certainly is holds a dear place um, in my heart. Old school days of seeing George Clinton and Parliament Funkadelic at tracks were, you know, amazing times. They're just, I mean, they go on and on. Punk shows at Tokyo Rose, weird little house parties. It's all genres, all styles. There's something to find here in Charlottesville, and it's great. For me, the first time I played in Charlottesville was before I lived here, and I played at tracks, which was fun. And we opened for Boyd Tinsley and the Boyd Tinsley band, who I didn't know at the time and later know, but so that was interesting. And so Trax was a good venue for me. Um, I played at the old CNO when there was music there. I think that's where I first met Tim Reynolds, who's kind of a major influence on my guitar playing and a, and a good friend at this point. I had good good gigs there. Um, I remember the old Van Ripers being fun. Uh, and I also remember the Outback Lodge, you know, if you needed a, a dive bar that had a PA and a, and a light show. <laughs> had some really good times there and they took care of me like family. I could sneak in the back door and they'd feed me and <laughs> I think I had a tab, <laughs> you know. That was good too, man. I kind of miss that. I miss having that dive bar type of rock scene here, you know. Uh, there's good venues here. We have great venues. But we need a bad venue. <laughs> if you know, a bad, good venue. <laughs> oh man, I mean, in olden days, I would definitely say the Outback Lodge. I spent a lot of time playing pool and dancing there to some funk music. Tokyo Rose was killer in college, Prism Coffee House. Uh, nowadays, I really like seeing shows at the Southern. It's got a really nice, intimate feel to it. Jefferson is outstanding. Uh, having the Sprint Pavilion down the street, Outdoor Pavilion is awesome. Just down the road, going to the National is is an incredible place to go see shows, and I like I really like the smaller club shows, the more intimate things because I feel like you get surprises on those. You you know, go out just for a night of drinks with your friends, and all of a sudden you're hearing some incredible music that you wouldn't get the chance to see. And five years down the road, they'll be you know playing much bigger bigger venues, and you can say that you got to see them when they were figuring it out. Well, Tokyo. Tokyo was fantastic to play at. Um, uh, just because everybody, I mean, at Sushi, at Sushi was really fantastic. Uh, everybody, everybody knew they had something special there. Uh, Darius, I mean, just like we were getting all these great bands from the would not have expected that just weren't coming to Charlottesville that were coming here. Uh, having the Pud House obviously was a really wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, I mean, there have been so many great places. Twisted Branch was really wonderful, it still is. Uh, we're playing shows at Low now, uh, and those are really intimate, intimate, wonderful shows. Uh, I remember playing at Tokyo Rose vividly, like the low ceilings and just the kind of, it, it felt cool, like it sounded good, but it was you know, kind of, a, kind of a grungy thing. You had these couches over in, <laughs> along the wall, right? And, uh, and, and that was a really cool place to play. And, and moving here in 99, I feel like there was already stories about things, you know, or, or there were places that seemed storied. Well, I was very involved in the whole music scene also, going way back to the Prism Coffee House, probably the late 70s, and I used to produce and promote concerts at tracks in Old Cabell Hall and the Prism, and I just, I love that scene too, and the folk music scene, you know, and also going back to the frats and Easter, so just a lot of fun, fun times in Charlottesville. The Gravity Lounge was weird but cool, you know, that's now the Southern, um, and I love that, it's just got a nice, and I know it's a weird space, but it, it's like seeing music in your living room for some reason to me. Um, I mean, we absolutely lucked out with uh, Blue Moon Diner when we kind of came in and took over. It already had a great history of being a music venue, so we really just had to maintain it in a lot of ways. and. Uh, 
having local musicians play regular gigs gets the word out and having you know touring musicians regional musicians who come through and just kind of rely on the good feeling of not necessarily a high paying gig but a gig where you know you're going to get a good meal and you know you're going to be treated nicely and that that can do a lot when you're living on the road and just having a friendly face and that's been exciting like as someone who loves music and grew up around musicians but have zero talent in and of my own skin it's really awesome to be able to support and help other people find their dreams and the caliber of uh, touring acts that come through here is pretty amazing too um, I like the Paramount for like that kind of experience um, Thanks to Rich for having us today. Such a beautiful day to share. The old Prism Coffee House was definitely a favorite spot of mine. Um, Fred always fed me uh, free coffee and cookie, <laughs> and it just it was cool. Um, My personal favorite is the Southern because it's the stage, and you're so close, and it's only a little bit high. So it reminds me of the old frat house parties we used to have at UVA and seeing a band and just rocking out and being literally close enough to touch the band i i love uh i love dirty nellies uh i love a place that uh, like stewart is, is a real kind of place they have their clientele they got a fireplace i love any place with a fireplace uh i played fellini's a bunch of times um tin whistle has been good do i i think i like a place that appreciates musicians and that's what charlottesville has a heck of a lot of it's got places that not only appreciate musicians, they appreciate songwriters. So a great venue, the one that a lot of maybe a lot of people here started out at, is just learning about the locals, Monday night songwriter open mic. You know, not just an open mic, but a songwriter open mic. They got a band there playing with Michael Clem, Rusty Spidell. At that time it was um, Brian um, Oh, I'm forgetting his last name. Now they have, you know, Paul Rosner's play. They've got these great musicians that are willing to back some some aspiring songwriter that barely wrote a song. We'll do it, give us the chords, and they that's a really great thing that this town, that individuals in this town, Jesse Harper, I think, created it. I was after his time, and I met Jesse Harper with a songwriting work workshop that I met Susan Munson at the local. These names all would mean something to people who know the place. You know, I met her there, she was doing a song, I did a song. I learned about it from some gal at a at a music store selling the guitar strings, and I hadn't tried to get in the music scene here yet, and I went, I'm like, this is incredible. And I wanted to do a duet, I wanted to write a duet with Susan, because I liked her song, and I approached her wanting to say that. I'm a songwriter, and she said, well, come to this songwriting workshop with us. So I never ended up, we do, she and I and Ann O'Brien and I do that duet now, which I ended up writing, but it was just her, the invitation. You know, people are very, not only supportive, but interested, interested in songs that people are writing. Me too, I, I am too. Well, I think um, Rich and I were talking about this the other day. Uh, we, we have these fond memories of places like Star Hill Music Hall and uh, Satellite Ballroom which were around when I first moved here 12 years ago and are no longer here. And then you sort of think back and if you really think about it, they weren't exactly the, the uh, grand palaces of music that we have now in this town, you know, so it's, uh, the nostalgia factor does creep in a little bit, so, uh, but I, I think of, because you think of those shows you saw there, you know, more than anything, and uh, the fact that those bands went on to become, like I saw Avid Brothers and Sharon Jones and Girl Talk all at Satellite Ballroom, and I saw some cool things at Star Hill too, and you just think of the history and the stories that you've heard from people who've been here even longer of the stuff they saw in those places, and you just think, wow, you know. Part of it was just the smallness of it, and um, maybe not so much the acoustics or the uh, <laughs> The, uh, the cleanliness, uh, but yeah, the atmosphere was, was cool in those two spots.